chance, please join me in welcoming Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Good morning, everyone. Please do, you know, keep half an ear on what I'm saying. Don't just think of the questions. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, this morning. Um, it seems to me to be a really good moment and a really good opportunity. But I want to start, if I may, by way of an apology. Uh, I am one of those people who hates keynote speakers who come to a conference, turn up, make their speech, and then disappear. Uh, however, I am one of those people uh, today. Um, I have another uh, event that I have to get to very swiftly, oh. uh, which means uh, that I'm afraid I can't stick around for much of today. But if you looked at the uh, conference agenda, you'll have seen the extent to which my colleagues in Sport England are with you and engaged and discussing some really fundamental parts of our ongoing uh, strategy and ambition. So I don't feel like uh, uh, we're abandoning you so much as it's just me. So uh, with that, uh, as Yvonne said, uh, the reason I wanted to come here today is to do exactly what she uh, requested, is to think about where we're at and share some thoughts on our current strategy towards an active nation um, and our progress against it so far and how we see it developing. And both from a sort of professional and personal uh, reasons, um, this seems to be an ideal time for me to look to do that. Personally, because um, actually virtually to the day, uh, this is nine months now since I uh, started as chief executive uh, at Sport England. So I now think I'm understanding a little bit more uh, not only what we're seeking to do, but some of the opportunities and the challenges we face. I think it's a little bit more familiar to me now and obvious, not least realising those areas uh, where we still have properly to engage. Perhaps if you sort of borrow that sort of famous phrase from Donald Rumsfeld, I'm starting to understand the, the known unknowns of the world that we're operating in. But also from an organisational point of view, the timing's pretty good uh, too. Uh, we are now comfortably um, halfway uh, through the funding cycle, the current funding cycle. Uh, not much more than 80 months away from its end actually, and really in reality only looking about the next 12 months of delivery against our current targets. So as I'll come on to shortly, we're also then considering what our next iteration of our strategy should be. And one thing I should say, I think, at the outset, when I sat down to reflect on, on the period of time, um, it's sometimes surprising how struck you are by how much actually has changed. And certainly in the case, uh, in this case, I've reflected very much how much we at Sport England have changed and learned over the past three years. And crucially, I think the valuable lessons we can draw from that as we move forward into our next strategy period. So I hope this morning, uh, quickly, that I can reflect also a, a useful moment for you, our many friends and partners in the room, like you say, Yvonne, a few faces that I recognize, but equally uh, many organizations, and so I'm delighted uh, are here, to pause and, and perhaps to consider what we've learned and achieved together. So I hope collectively we can take stock and then you know, consider not only where we've come from and where we are, but crucially, collectively, where we're headed. So if I reflect first on towards an active nation, uh, as a sector, there are now things perhaps that we are all more used to talking about as we devise and deliver the many physical activity programs and approaches that drive our work every day. Our focus on social outcomes, the idea of being audience led, considering the whole system and its interconnectivity, taking different approaches to addressing inactivity and addressing inequality. They do seem familiar, they're quite easy to think about and say now, but if you cast your mind back at just a few years, maybe just to, to May 2016, that was the date of the publication of Towards an Active Nation, Sport England's response to the government's Sporting Futures strategy that had been published just uh, the Christmas before. And I know, I was around in the, in the system elsewhere, just quite how groundbreaking and transformational the spirit and the intention <laughs> that underpinned that government strategy was at the time. How different it felt across the sport and physical activity landscape. Because I think it genuinely offered a radical new approach. It asked a lot of questions of Sport England, of our partners. I think it prompted, in fact I know it prompted, some pretty difficult conversations. Because ultimately it challenged all of us to think, behave and make decisions differently. Crucially, and I think positively, it united us around a crystal clear shared mission that would take more than business as usual to address, truly ensuring that sport and physical activity 
works for everyone in every community and from every background. Not for the sake of it or because it was what we had always done or indeed because of some vague notion that sport was and is intrinsically a good thing, but because doing it would rather drive real and specific benefits from which the whole nation could and more pertinently should benefit. The physical benefits and well-being, improved mental health, the sense of agency and confidence that being active can bring to individuals, more social cohesion, improved communities in our towns, cities and villages, and ultimately the economic benefits that a nation to the nation of a more engaged, active population. Those five positive outcomes for sport, we kind of speak of them quite comfortably now. They underpinned the government strategy against which all of our investments in our sector would then be judged. But they were pretty brand new concepts, I think, or at least they were pretty brand new in strategic terms with the need to grapple with them in 2016. They represented quite a significant shift in, in thinking, and it meant a big difference in the way that we would need to act. So in response to that, and the huge ambition set out, I know my colleagues at the time also had to shift. I think they had to, well, we had to rethink how we worked, what Sport England would need to deliver to meet the government's ambition, but also to generate meaningful and positive impact on society. It meant a step change, perhaps, in how we considered and then measured physical activity and participation in sport. So in that period, we have introduced the Active Life Survey, providing a truly world-class analysis and insight into how the nation is choosing to get active. Insight which is now shaping our work and the work of partners across the sector at every level. Then there's the breadth of partnerships with whom Sport England realised it would needed to collaborate. The conscious, positive choice, in a sense, to be more partner neutral in our delivery of our strategy, focusing not on who you are, but who and how you can engage. Leading to our now working with a network of brilliant partners, I think, from sports and in many cases now beyond. People completely new to the sport landscape in our world and indeed our language but who through their trusted status with the audiences we needed to reach a best place to help people from all walks of life to access sport and physical activity. Another major change I think we can reflect has been where we work, recognising the vital importance of a sense of place in all our engagement. This has led to some more local focus and approach, I think taking our work into the heart of communities across England to learn from the local experts listen and empathise with communities and therefore try and remove some of the barriers and create change. What many of you will know, perhaps, is the ABCD of social change, working through asset-based community development, where the focus of activity is those assets, the organisations, the people, the relationships that already exist and, crucially, have the trust of those we want to reach, rather than inventing something new and then foisting it upon people who may not even want it and certainly won't easily trust it. So we have, for example, this cycle invested about 100 million of national lottery funding into new local delivery pilots in 12 areas of the country to make this a reality. And as I think I'll come back to in a moment, we're already seeing how this approach is bearing fruit in some of the most economically deprived areas of the country. We've also fundamentally changed how we think about data and innovation so that we can seize the opportunity of digital transformation as a sector and harness it to reach more people in new and unexpected ways. And indeed, through our partnership with the Open Data Institute and seeing organisations taking steps to open up their data, we're now seeing that they can create conditions for real innovation. We've definitely, as an organisation, and I think as a sector, grown in confidence in our approach to that. But there's a lot more that we can do. I think we've also grown in confidence in our approach to consumer campaigning, building on the success of the phenomenon that is the This Girl Can campaign, and partnering in different ways to launch new innovative consumer campaigns that support and inspire new audiences to engage in sport and to become more physically active. <laughs> as I think being covered in a session later this morning. Last month, we launched We Are Undefeatable, a campaign 
informed by our insight, backed by national lottery funding, and driven by the trusted status of 15 leading health charities to inspire the one in four people in this country who are living with a long-term health condition, that being active can be for them, that the message they more obviously receive, that rest is best, is not necessarily right. It's a really interesting campaign model for us. It's pretty new to us as well. And the charities involved, um, finding it new for them as well. But I think it speaks volumes about how we need to work differently. The charities know their audience best. We know how best, perhaps, to, rep to represent the positive benefits of sport and physical activity. Separately, we might have previously created parallel or even conflicting messages. Whereas together, we have a powerful, unified message that is already cutting through to those that previously may have thought that being active, playing sport, was simply not for them. Then if I reflect again across other areas of the strategy, there's our efforts to get under the skin of the activity levels of our children and the single fundamental unifying insight that more than anything, it is fun, the sheer enjoyment of being active, which will build a generation of young people more likely to continue and positively engage into their adult lives. It sounds kind of obvious when you say it now, but it's really quite telling how profound that realization is when set against previous policy. And indeed, if I may say, against quite a lot of thinking within government. Indeed, elsewhere this morning at Twickenham, in fact, uh, many representatives from across both the sport and the education systems are meeting to determine the next best steps for the government's recently published school sport action plan. And that sense of physical literacy, that positive enjoyment of being active, will I know be at the heart of their discussion. So if you think across all those areas that I've discussed in the last few minutes, I've given you a snapshot really of where the focus of our activity has gone and where we at Sports England have sought to prioritise in our continued delivery of Towards an Active Nation. And I hope in bringing to life some of the ways we've sought to do things differently in this period as a result of the new approach that the strategy represents and indeed the government's own strategy simply demands. So three years in, with the support and partnership of a wide range of organisations, I think I would say we are seeing some signs of progress. Certainly, if you look, 28 million people at the last count are registered as active. That means doing at least 150 minutes of physical activity a week. And this number continues to grow. Nearly half a million more people were active last year than the year before that. And we have our next set of Active Lives figures out, I think, next month. It includes rising numbers of women, disabled people, and over 55s. And this is thanks in no small part to the brilliant innovative programs, opportunities, and sports facilities made available across the country, many of them by organizations here today, I know, inspired by the ambition of Towards an Active Nation and the social outcomes we're seeking to achieve. I don't feel, I don't think any of my colleagues feel that that number is a, just a nice achievement. And certainly, although it is a target, it's not about meeting targets or ticking boxes. This is about 28 million people who are living happier, healthier lives because of the transformational impact sport and physical activity is having on them. So I think we have much to be pleased with. And clearly, in many ways, we are, put simply, doing a good job. But I hope there's no one in this room that would think that good is good enough. We are still not reaching a significant proportion of the population in England. 28 million people active, but that leaves us with 16 people. 16 million people, be easy if it was 16. <laughs> that we could sort that. 16 million people who are not regularly active. And of that, around 11 million, that's a quarter of the population in England, are, are registered as inactive. That's doing less than 30 minutes a week or indeed, in some cases, many cases, doing none at all. There are many reasons for this, but it is clear that there are some consistent barriers to entry that mean too many people are not benefiting from sport and being physically active. Put bluntly, where the sport and physical act activity system works for many, there are some residual stubborn inequalities, which means that it does not work for all. 
That's our mission. That's what we need to change. That should be unashamedly our collective priority and our focus as a sector. As what we have learned in mind, I'd therefore like briefly to highlight, if I may, as we look ahead to what will be our next strategy period, some of the principles that may underpin how we will look to, to approach that particular task. Firstly, I want to sort of be clear now that Sport England's next strategy will cover the 21-25 period. It will be evolutionary rather than revolutionary. I think we knew when we launched towards an active nation, my colleagues at the time, that it was going to be a long-term process. That it wouldn't necessarily fit neatly into four-year funding cycles. We know the world just isn't like that. And in fact, it was clear that the gov government strategy, Sporting Futures, set out a vision for at least eight years, if not beyond. So in many ways, rather than approaching the end of our strategy period now, we're really just approaching perhaps the half-time whistle of a rather longer game. That's why we're thinking of our next strategy period really as evolving, building on the things that have worked, but also acknowledging those approaches that haven't and learning from the things that we have tried. Abraham Lincoln once said, if I have six hours to chop down a tree, I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. In some ways, while we've achieved much, the current strategy period for Sport England is our version of ax sharpening. So as we look forward, the powerful, positive role of sport and physical activity to transform people and places for the better remains our driver. Ensuring that in everything we're thinking about and planning, we consider how the five outcomes can benefit all groups. And as I said before, focusing unashamedly and disproportionately in our investment on those groups and communities that feel currently least able to engage, who feel that sport and physical activity just isn't for them. Those that perhaps previously, and I think lazily, we might have described as hard to reach, they are not. It's just that the system that provides for people being active tends to exclude them from involvement. We are also, I think, critically thinking now about how we engage with others with as much focus as what we do. Recognizing the need to harness the collective strengths that we have together through a more collaborative partnership-based approach. And in doing so, ensuring that our core values of Sport England genuinely underpin how it feels to work with us. Many of you have already told us, certainly told me, that you want to work differently with us. And I think we've been listening. And I recognize that too often in the past, dealing with Sport England may have been too mechanistic and, and transactional in its approach. That speaking to us maybe felt like a meeting with your bank manager rather more than it generally was feeling like a conversation and a partnership united in a shared mission. So I think as we develop this strategy over the coming months, you will hear some of these messages repeated again and again. Because we're basing our strategy more, I think, on ways of working that are collaborative and we'll be seeking to work with people across sport to create this togetherness as much as possible. Leveraging the various skills, resources, and expertise across the whole system that can only succeed if we work together. Indeed, recognizing how codependent we all are on each other genuinely to impact on the lives of everyone in society. Which is why I always feel we should talk and consider ourselves more part of an ecosystem than a system, because there's a genuine dependency on each other to make sure the whole can survive and thrive. To put it another way, for Sport England solely to assume the responsibility to engage everyone in the country positively in sport and physical activity is, I think, an impossible task. It might be possible if it was six, 16 people, but 16 million, a little different. What a former board member of mine when I was at the British Paralympic Association used to describe as just trying to boil the ocean. But working together, we can genuinely create the resource, the capacity that can make a significant positive impact. Not just the 300 people working directly in Sport England, but thinking of that extended workforce of the sport and physical activity sector that includes all of you and many other organizations. So while ultimately, of course, in strategic terms, we will own it, we don't want our new strategy to come as a surprise to the sector. 
or be something that is unveiled or launched with no understanding of its content. Instead, we want everyone to feel like they have been able to play a part in its development, because together we can reap the benefits that our work can achieve. More people taking part in sport and physical activity, a decrease in inactivity in all areas of our society, a fairer distribution of the benefits across the nation, stronger communities, individuals living happier, healthier lives. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Neil Cameron uh, from Sportworks. Uh, we're um, a community sport provider, have been working with Sport England uh, for a number of years now. Just picking up on one of your points there, Yvonne, actually, about the innovation. One of the key messages, I think, from the, uh, well, the funding that we received from you was about let's try new things, let's innovate. Multiply that by across the country and all the different providers, that's a very expensive and and could be quite an inefficient way of working. So I was just really interested in your thoughts on how you could take that really positive message about innovation, trying new things, being okay to fail, whilst balancing probably quite a tight budget decision for next round. Um, I think, first of all, I want to emphasize the uh, real impact that our desire to innovate is having, not at least our own approach to that, which is I mentioned the local delivery pilots that we've been running across uh, 12 different parts of the country, very, very different in scale. Uh, some of them uh, substantial uh, parts of the country, like uh, Greater Manchester. Um, there's one um, in Hackney that's just covering really just a couple of, of estates. So what that's shown us in a number of ways is that we have to, uh, in innovating, doing things differently, we have to think about the solutions differently as well. So rather than thinking that the only way then to take whatever we've learned there and then replicate it and scale it across every community in the country, which clearly both impossible and unaffordable, it's about learning from the lessons that, are, that, that those pilots are showing us um, and then realizing how that can be done more strategically across uh, a sector as a whole. I'll give you one example. Um, I think definitely uh, where we went into some of the local pilots, I can think of a couple. I'll mention um, Essex as one. Uh, when we went in, I think it was about the additional resource. It was that mechanistic, traditional view of what delivery was supposed to be. Uh, what has happened is that the work of the local delivery pilot in seeking to be asset-based, in thinking about turning the telescope around, really, and looking down on a problem so rather than looking down on a problem with what we thought was a preordained solution, actually understanding what the issues were and then realizing what we as a sector can do to help solve them. It's created a conversation at a local level that has generated significant interaction at a local authority level, particularly between the health sector, the transport sector, the education sector in that local environment. So there's a really good example of where an innovation doesn't require us to resource it more in order for change to happen because the resource itself is now in place much more through a much more combined whole system approach in, 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 in place. Um, I think the bigger challenge to, in your question is when it comes to a program or a project, and is there something that we can see that is working that can be scalable, and how, how affordable would that be? Um, and I think, again, our job, as I sort of suggested, has got, therefore, to be more about the advocacy and the and the collation of thinking rather than the mechanistic delivery of outcomes because we need you as a as a sector to be much more able to do that and therefore the resources collectively there rather than thinking you know if we're going to come up with a solution we have to buy it all the time uh, so I don't think it's that sense of ecosystem it's that sense of wanting to to work as a collaborative sector is wholly about that. It's wholly about what we learn through innovation, what we can learn through working with various people in, in new ways, where we can, as you say, learn from failure as long as you do what Samuel Better, Beckett said and fail better, you know, when you fail. Um, I, I, don't, I think it's, it's taking that learning and then advocating that, communicating that, being part of the, creating a sort of a, a sense of the collegiate view of what's needed and what's possible to then harness the existing resource that's in the sector to deliver it, rather than thinking we then, as Sport England, need to fund it through uh, you know, a grant. I hope that answers your question in some way. Thank you, great question. Yes, sir. 
just here. Hi, I'm Michael Follett, Director of Opal Outdoor Play and Learning. Is that on? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wondered, what are the particular challenges and what are the solutions of getting children who don't like sport and PE to do more of it? Well, pretty much as I said, um, the experience is the most important factor in all of this at an early stage. Um, it's quite compellingly obvious from our, we we conducted our first Active Lives Children's Survey uh, at the end of last year, published it earlier this year. Um, and the, uh, the results were pretty stark, um, that actually the single biggest factor in getting young people to want to engage in being active and play sport is that they enjoy it. Not that they learn a technical skill, not that they win, not that they are necessarily the people who are uh, naturally going to be engaged in it, but that they enjoy it. And I think we have traditionally seen it as being more about uh, the competitive element too early. Now, I'm a big fan of competitive sport, although I'm not very good at it. Um, so the reality is I don't want ever to have a system that, that doesn't see the future progression of people with talent and enjoyment of that. Um, but that's later. What has to, where you have to start is with uh, a, 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 an ex a experience that is actually inclusive, genuinely, of everyone and makes it an enjoyable one that people don't think about I, I'm not going to say who the politicians were, but recent um, uh, interesting conversation with a couple of senior politicians uh, that wasn't about Brexit. Um, uh, the two responses that they gave, one who was very much a traditional sport-minded person, when they were asked to give one word about their own experiences of school sport, was winning. And the other politician said, cold. And I think we have to recognize that both of those things are entirely valid, but that if we want those people to become more active in their adult lives, the experience and the quality of the experience when they're younger. So in primary schools, particularly, physical literacy, rather than really you know, organized, codified games where there are winners and losers and people stand around doing nothing or, or get cold or don't enjoy the process at all of, of being made to do things, at that age um, is much more engaging, much more enjoyable, so that there's more intent for people to become more active when they're older. Great stuff, thank you. And uh, Nicola, I'm sure you can relate to the cold, cold days. Oh yeah, but I'm sure you love winning as well, didn't you, Nicola? <laughs> That's why I played netball, I was too soft. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got time uh, uh, for uh, Just another, just oh, a couple on. of other things actually on that, because it is, it is a really live issue. I think the other, the other two things we need to think about strategically it's the quantity and quality of the engagement in schools. So there's a good debate about how much time young people should be uh, doing PE in school sport. But within that, we have to be always thinking about the quality of that experience. So personally, I think the best intervention we as a sector could do in, in school sport is teacher training, where we actually engage in allowing, particularly at, at primary, but also at secondary school, those responsible for the experience to know more about how to make it more fun, how to make it more enjoyable. It's not part of the curriculum. Very rarely, even even you know, with those that, that specialise in PE, it's not necessarily a part of the curriculum that they study. And then if there was something else as well, and this is a big thing for us, to get the sort of Ofsted measurement of the whole school, to consider more that experience as being a key part of what, what makes a whole child. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Probably one more question. We've got a gentleman on the front here, and then we'll have to wrap up, I'm afraid. I'm a bit, Dave said on Twitter this morning that he was looking forward to this speech, so I'm now going to oh, find out whether... Uh, Should I choose a different yeah. person? <laughs> How would you like me to grade you? <laughs> Sorry? Um, so, Dave Hembra, uh, I'm from Sheffield Hallam. Uh, I represent British Weightlifting. I'm the head coach of Hallam Barbell Weightlifting Club too. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I did enjoy it. Uh, I look forward to uh, living those ambitions in the future. Uh, my, my question is, uh, a couple of weeks ago, or recently, the new physical activity guidelines came out mm. as a weightlifting coach and yeah. representing British weightlifting. Great to see strength and balance as an increased priority. Um, what, what's the relationship and the relatedness between Sport England and the physical activity guidelines? How do we feed into those and how do they reflect our ambitions? Well, the best way to get a really consolidated answer to that is that I think my colleague Sarah Ruan is doing a session on exactly that later this morning. So I'm sure all the other sessions are excellent as well, but that would be a good one to, uh, 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 to go along to. But in short, we're, one of the most interesting elements of our change strategy is how it has opened up conversations more broadly across sectors 
And ultimately, when you think about um, what, we collect, what we can collectively achieve, part of our job, perhaps, at Sport England is to think how can we engage at senior and policy level with health, with education, transport, the other major departments, where not only could we unlock uh, their funding, and it's worth reflecting that Sport England's budget, although I know all of you will think it's a lot of money, but it's one five hundredth of the health service budget every year, what we have to spend. So if we could unlock some of that, we can have real impact on potentially people's lives. Uh, but one of our interesting uh, increasing relationships uh, across the piece are with those areas of um, the health sector that previously wouldn't have considered physical activity as being as key as prevention in other, in other forms or indeed cure. So we have a, a strong relationship with Public Health England now, for example, where we have a, a joint program and an agreement, uh, uh, an MOU, uh, where we are looking to deliver um, a genuinely incisive uh, set of education and training for GPs and primary health care professionals to understand more about the benefits of social prescribing, for example, and, and seeing physical activity as a, as, a, as a positive force rather than as something that they don't necessarily trust or understand to, to prescribe uh, to their patients. Uh, but alongside that, we've worked quite a lot with the Chief Medical Officer um, and, and her, her team. She's obviously current Chief Medical Officer is just stepping down. Uh, but those guidelines we were very involved in. Uh, my colleague, as I say, Sarah, who's uh, speaking later, uh, very closely engaged in that and the team. Um, and I think we were pleased to see that, that strength and balance was incre increasingly given a focus alongside cardiovascular um, activity. I still think, personally, we'd still look at it and say there's some way to go in terms of the message that you give. You know, it's pretty clunky to say either 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise, such as to raise your heartbeat, you know, to a certain level. That's fundamentally where the CMO and the guidelines are. Equally, some of the, the definitions of what strength and balance you need to do over a period of time as well are not ideal. But I'd far rather be here worrying about that than finding that no one in that sector is thinking about the benefits of being active and, the, and what the guidelines should be. There is also, I think, a positivity in that message that every bit counts, which wasn't previously the case before. And certainly, again, if you're looking at strength or, or balance, short but regular uh, engagement in that is going to be positive for your health and well-being. So the short answer to your question is, Yes, we're engaging with the CMO and been involved in the in the production of these guidelines, and in fact gave a um, you know had a had a hand in its, their announcement when they came out last Saturday. Uh, the longer, bigger answer is is that what you're really alluding to is there is a whole sector around health that relates to people's physical well-being and activity that we as a sector and we as Sport England absolutely need to engage in more, and that's very key to our agenda. Great stuff. Um, just a quick one from me then. You mentioned the new strategy. Yeah. Um, what will the consultation process be like for that, just so that people in the room have got a sense of how to get involved? Um, yes, well, rather than sort of in part iterative, because as I mentioned, we want to sort of see it as very evolutionary. I would say as a, as a, as a key message for today, I don't intend the publication of a document to be, any, you know, probably be a year's time, because I think that's appropriate. Um, we won't be looking to do anything more than that because that gives us good opportunity to work with everyone before then to look where we can to be as co-creating as possible with its content. Uh, basically, between now and Christmas, uh, we're looking to start to, dreadful word, but sort of socialise the ideas. So today, in part, is that. You know, I've outlined a few things to you today as to where, certainly where we are and where we're headed. So you can start to think about what those are and how they might work uh, in your environment, whether that's in schools, whether that's in the health sector, but more importantly, how can we collectively harness the resource and the uh, innovation, and most importantly, the trusted partnerships and relationships that we collectively all have. So I think before, between now and, and sort of the end of the year, we want just to be doing that, to be having the conversations, to be talking in our ongoing engagement, to not be doing anything specific in terms of a consultation, but more just a, a discussion. Then I think our ambition at the moment, and we'll confirm this uh, in the next couple of weeks, is that in the new year, we'll then publish what is akin to a sort of straw man, is that the right phrase? Some sort of element of a thinking, which can then be the basis of a more formal basic con consultation. Um, I don't think, if I'm reading rooms and reading conversations and listening to people rightly, that the overall direction of travel is, being, is going to be an element of contention. Clearly, what's really important for us is that we understand how people feel about how they can contribute to it, and therefore how we can construct the sorts of areas and ways that we will work. 
But if there's one absolutely fundamental uh, recognition that we've got from this cycle again, and you know, Chris Perks is over there um, for anyone who wants to talk about it more. What we've learned from our local work, what we're learning from how you create a sense of place. In fact, if anything, and because I was seeing Jenny as well, who's talking about volunteering in a bit, also an excellent session. Um, the, if you look at really how it all comes together, we'll be looking and thinking and consulting around purpose, people, and place. So what is the purpose of being physical, act, of, of physical activity in sport? Why does it matter to society? How can we absolutely advocate and campaign and drive an agenda and a message that gets that change of footing from perhaps a reactive view of it or a view that it's not for everyone to the fact that it can be? Critically, what role do people play in that? And that is the workforce, professional and volunteer, who are supporting every engagement, every intervention, every program, every experience that people have. Because if we don't get that bit right at both the professional and volunteer level, then we won't have the sustained engagement that we're looking to have. And then lastly, that sense of place. How local engagement in a local environment with the right facilities and the right engagement and the right active design around transport and housing and all the things that can come together to create a more active nation. So if there's any, if there's any way that the, I can see the consultation going more specifically, it'd be around purpose, people, and, and place. Um, but yeah, talking about it now, thinking about it and, and consulting on it in, in the first half of the, the new year, publishing in about a year's time, starting 1st of April 2021. Lovely. Thank you very much Better for do that joining now. us this morning. Great question. Um, yeah. And uh, I know you've got to uh, dash off at some point, so uh, we yeah. appreciate your involvement uh, and Sport England support uh, here today. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne.